you considered doing a special segment on position sizing? And you know, any thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. We've done a lot of uh, we've got a lot of commentary, and thanks for that question. I know that uh, you're probably new to our process, and we appreciate that. Again, we I've talked a lot about sizing uh, over the years, and and how I think about things is again relative to the to the size that you've agreed with yourself to have. So you, you have a series of rules. Okay, so one very simple setup that I've had over the years where uh, if I have my longs and I have my shorts, can you see that? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so like my, my highest conviction long position might be 6%, my next long position might be 3%, my next long position might be 1%. So again, these are multiples of each other. This is my top conviction position. This is my lowest conviction position. If I'm gonna have a position, it's not gonna be less than 1% because that's not how I roll. Uh, but how I think, that's how I think about it. And then I'd say, okay, my, my shorts should be 50% of my top long position because shorts should always, always be smaller in terms of the single security position than longs. And if you don't understand why, you can just try doing it for 18 years and you'll see that if you get squeezed on a massive short position, you could ruin your entire year by just being in the wrong spot because of course these have unlimited upside. So again, I learned that um, in my book I wrote about the um, or Rich Blake and I did rather, we just recounted when I was short Reebok. Uh, if I only had a half a percent short position in Reebok, I still could have lost uh, pretty much my entire quarter um, in terms of performance. Uh, but again, I, that's kind of the way that I do that. So again, just think about these in terms of sizing. So you'd say this one and a half, and this could be 0.75%, whatever it is. Um, you know, you just have your ratios. And once you set up, these ratios can be different for different, different people. So if you're an activist manager, your top position might be 12%. Your next position might be six. Your next position might be three. You know, so again, you have to decide for yourself what it is that you're trying to accomplish. But once you decide, like once you've decided to get married to this, think about marriage. If you're not married, maybe consider it. I like marriage. I think it's a popular kind of a thing to do um, for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of benefits to marriage. But you have to commit, okay? You have to absolutely commit or your marriage is not gonna end well. So when you commit to what it is that you're trying to accomplish, then you strike that portfolio every day with the same commitment and the same activity. So you don't just like wake up emotionally and say, I'm going to take a starter position today that is going to be a 3% position. I mean, that's not that if, if my rule is I start with one, I start with one and I average in. Okay. So that's how I deal with it. And I had to, you, know, you have to do this with live ammo. I mean, uh, you know, God, God bless and, and Godspeed uh, to, or God bless rather, God bless John Dawson for giving me the opportunity to, to, to again, get a carved out portfolio of a, of a major hedge fund and, and learn on the job, really. I mean, you should have seen some of the things I was doing. Uh, and you learn pretty quickly. Uh, and, and in that case, thank God it was with other people's capital. I mean, that's, that's the note, by the way, to Wall Street is that you're actually doing it with other people's money. Um, so if I totally screwed it up, it wouldn't have totally screwed me over. I would have just gotten fired. Um, but if you're doing it with your own money, uh, which obviously I do now, you want to do things in a consistent way so that your portfolio is being tapped and again struck in terms of its decisions consistently and again within the framework of rules that you made up on your own. And I think one other thing that's also important is to take good notes. I mean, you have what, 18 years of notebooks to go back and figure out when you made uh, poor decisions to learn from? Yeah. You know, as opposed to sort of willy nilly uh, kind of winging it. I think a lot of investors out there read a lot of Zero Hedge and Hussman and, and, and feel a certain way in the morning and then they, you know, they start reacting. Angry. Come in angry. <laughs> yeah. Just angry. Uh, so, uh, no, the conversely, you can be reading uh, whatever the opposite of that is, I'm not sure, <laughs> um, and feel <laughs> overly bullish. Uh, I, I think it's just really important to have a consistent process and hopefully we're helping uh, deliver that to, to investors. Yeah, when I get up in the morning, I get like, so let's just say that these are my rules. These aren't my rules currently. I've, I've used something similar to this in a hedge fund format. Um, but I don't run a hedge fund anymore. So like this idea came in from an analyst, right? So if this is my portfolio and my starter position is 1%, trip would be a 1% starter position. That's where I would have started, 1%. Then I'll basically be up and down Hisham, Shaban's you know, backside for the next two to three weeks trying to understand like, okay, did we actually, is this the right entry point? Should we be taking this position up? Should we get the, get the hell out of it? Like, did we just put it on because it was down? Like, this is what I've I've made every mistake in that one that you could possibly make. Because again, I was I was a long short guy, only stocks, and then I evolved my process into having a macro overlay because I didn't want to get run over by macro. But I understand very uh, very uniquely how to not screw up that kind of a situation. So that's actually how we built Agile. We have a bunch of analysts who are constantly throwing tickers 
into the speedball machine and you got to get you got to get up to speed quick because we have 14,000 what uh, 15 20,000 hedge fund managers now they're all trying to beat you they're all trying to figure out where do you buy trip are you going to buy it you know right are you going to buy it too early uh, are you going to miss it that's that's these are the decisions we need to make but that's how I would make a decision like that if it's a single security with a lot of beta um, that's currently showing me an opportunity. Kind of going back in the early look note this morning, uh, really simple when you just like write it down and you have to write, like I have to write every morning uh, and then I have to talk and that's why people say that I talk too much because I talk about what I write about. Uh, but somebody's got to do it. I mean, for God's sakes. Just take, <coughs> take three things. One, what's growth doing? Accelerate. Let's just say it's going up or down, okay? Let's just say that we have a column here, we're going to say that it's going up or down. Two, inflation. What's that do? Up or down? Up. Three, earnings. Season. Is that going up or down? Up. There's nothing in there that says Donald Trump. I can't for the life of me find in this gigantic three-factor model that most fundamental investors should abide by, growth, inflation, and earnings, if you could have just separated your politics and your ideologies about politicians, and you just said, okay, what's, what's my research team's outlook from November until February and going forward on growth, inflation, and earnings, you would have nailed it, and I hope you did. I just wanted to get that off my chest. Are junk bonds a good buy in quad one? They should be. Right? Yes, we'll have historically for sure. I don't know if you have any additional It shouldn't be an thoughts. opinion, is it? It's just a fact. Yeah, it is a fact. Junk bonds uh, perform best in quad one, as do most other uh, high beta uh, factor exposures um, in anything cyclically oriented. High beta. So we walked through this yesterday. If you look at the style factors that you want to be overweight under these conditions, growth and inflation accelerating. Let's just make, let's just tie a Tiffany blue bow on this. They're having some branding issues. Let's help them out. Let's give them a little blue. Let's call it quad two. That's when this and this is happening at the same time. Okay? So that's quad two. Uh, the question was about quad one, of course. Um, and it's kind of an interesting debate as to whether or not the market's pricing in more quad two or is just going to quad one. Don't forget that uh, commodities have kind of underperformed as of late. Energy is definitely underperformed as of late. So maybe the market's just going to quad one, Darius, because guess what? For Q2, Q3, and Q4, the U.S. economy is not going to be in quad two in our model. It's going to be in quad one, where inflation in rate of change terms starts to slow a little bit. Now that's the mecca. For those of you, uh, you know, natural born human beings who get paid in dollars, uh, who's, the things that you buy, think about the gas, uh, or the pizza, or the food, or anything that could be deflated. Let's just uh, imagine the wild concept for a second that you actually get paid in dollars and the value of those dollars are going up and commodities stay flat to down or anything that you pay for. Now that's awesome. Isn't that awesome? Your purchasing power is going up. That's why we love strong dollar, strong America, rising dollar, rising interest rates. This is history. This is not an opinion. Looking back at the two year period of 2014 to 2016, the data research market was all telling the story of an oncoming widespread U.S. recession. Keith, you had the right call on long bonds and the data was uh, collaborating. But we only saw an equity crash in August 15 and Jan January 16 that really showed you how fast the crowd turns <clears throat> and was uh, brought right back to hit higher highs. How could you be wrong in the buy the dip this year? Well, I mean, the, I appreciate you recapping the call that we had. Yeah, we sold U.S. equities in, in, in July of 2015 and yeah they crashed by February of 2016. The main point there that you know was happening from literally Q1 2015 and you know, we didn't get bearish till July or Q2 of 2015 but again from that point to the low of, of February and really Q2 US growth slowing that's just a fact. You had 200 basis points of a slowdown in GDP. You went from three point I've shown this a bazillion times but if GDP is a sine curve it peaked at 3.3 percent in Q1 of 2015 and went down 200 basis points by Q2 of 2015 to 1.3 percent. Okay? It's a little scratchy. Looks a little scratchy this morning, huh? Scratch that. 3.3 to 1.3, that's 200 basis points or 2 percent of a GDP slowdown 
That's why we got paid. Okay, that's why we got paid on the long side of that, which is buy bonds when that happens. And on the short side of that, we made plenty of money on the short side of US domestic small caps, you, uh, financials. I mean, we were short financials throughout that period. So again, I wouldn't focus so much on why the market could crash tomorrow. I mean, that's not what I do. I don't like wake up in the morning and go, oh, we're gonna crash. <laughs> I mean, if, if I get a bunch of growth slowing data, then I'd be like, hmm, maybe the probability is starting to rise that we could start to go down. But I wouldn't like, like just, you know, can you imagine waking up at Zero Hedge with like the other three guys that can't, you know, that are banned from the securities industry and they're sitting there like, every morning you're just like looking for bloody help. I mean, you, you just come in every day, oh, this is it, this is it. Oh, I've been looking for it, there it is. If you're looking for something, you're gonna find it. I mean, you're gonna find it. And, and at the end of the day, that's, that's the sad reality of the media today. No matter what the media is, if it's mainstream or otherwise, you, if you wanna find your bias, you will find it somewhere. But if you are not biased and you're rate of change data driven, the data is the data. And that's what I'd say about that. I am not predicting a correction until I, it's not a prediction. I would not be setting up for a correction until I see growth data slowing at a bare minimum. So that's, that's what I've thought and that's what I think. And that's why we've been on the right side of this equity market movement.